네, 저희 마지막 세션으로는 머신러닝 실험 트래킹 툴로 유명하고 또 최근에는 LLM과 관련해서 여러 기능을 내놓고 있는 웨이트 앤 바이아스를 어렵게 모셨습니다. 저희 LLM 프롬트와 관련된 기능도 최근에 많이 출시했다고 하는데요. 네, 그럼 웨이트 앤 바이아스의 시각에서 LLM은 어떤 건지 오늘 웨이트 앤 바이아스에서 Head of Japan and Korea를 담당하시는 아키라를 모시고 발표를 들어보겠습니다. Uh, next we have weights and bias known for their machine learning tracking tools. Today we are lucky to have Akira, the head of Japan and Korea from weights and biases, to tell us more about prompts for LLMs. Let's give a big welcome to Akira. Thank you. 안녕하세요. Uh, uh. Yeah, so uh, that's the end of my Korean today. I'm sorry. Um, the, some slides have been translated my, my, by my colleague. Um, we are currently basing our Asia expansion in Tokyo, um, but I'm extremely excited to be here. Um, if I can figure this out. Yeah, well, so I'm the country manager of weights and biases for Asia uh, since this year, but uh, the reason that I'm here is that um, this is the number of weights and biases users, and uh, it's like going crazy now, you see, especially in Korea and also in Japan. But I, I find it very interesting that uh, there's more users in here uh, compared to Japan. And uh, this week I was at the AI Summit at COEX and uh, everybody seemed to know us already. How, how many weights and biases users here? None? Oh, quite a few? Don't be shy, please. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, not surprised at all. And um, yeah, a little bit about myself. My name is Akira. I have been in data and AI for quite a long time now. I started my career as a particle physicist. Uh, you know, elementary particle physics, you like, you know, use accelerator to accelerate them and smash them. So that's where I started with my data and AI. We used a bit of AI as well. Maybe you don't call it AI anymore, but back then it was AI. Is, is English okay? I, I'm really, because like Aaron told me like maybe half of you would understand. And then he said most of you would understand. So I'm not quite sure what, I, what to make of it. But yeah, then I started my own company uh, back in 2013. I was in NLP. Uh, things were quite different back then, you know? Like we don't call it anymore NLP, but you know, it was like, a lot of fun doing it, you know, even though the technology wasn't quite there. Uh, we were scraping a lot of data from the internet and trying to organize it using uh, topic models and we were trying to provide a news curation app and things like that. Then I was the head of um, Data Robot for Japan uh, for a little bit. Um, data Robot, does every, anybody know Data Robot? Yes? A few people, fewer people. Okay, but it's an auto ML. Uh, application and uh, we worked with very diverse set of industries like existing industry right like manufacturing and retail and banking and it was very interesting to see how much difference we can make with data and AI in these conventional industries and then I was really interested in what more can we do with data and AI and around two years ago I could see generative AI coming up. Like, you know, GAN, you know GAN? Like, you know, you probably know GAN, but like it was starting to generate faces. And, you know, we were trying to see how we can apply that in the process of design, for example. This company, Cosmo, is a startup in Japan. And uh, we worked primarily on music generation, for example. And uh, it was a lot of fun, as well as really starting to feel the changes. You probably know this painting, yes, this was like the first painting to be um, in Sotheby's auction and it went for quite a good amount of money. So, you know, I was really starting to be interested in generative AI and I was right to be interested in, in it um, since all the changes are happening, right, since the end of last year uh, with LLMs. So, talking a little bit about weights and biases, uh, we are based uh, our headquarter is based in San Francisco. And uh, we have been pretty well funded, over 200 million 
250 million. Uh, we work very closely with NVIDIA because all of our users are deep learning engineers, which makes them NVIDIA customer as well. So we work very closely with them. Uh, I'm very proud to say that a lot of our customers are very high profile, cutting edge, uh, generative AI, as well as other kind of AI. And uh, our partnership extends beyond our customers, but also NVIDIA and all the cloud platforms. And we are very proud of ourselves in having a very good integration with all the other tools that you rely on, such as PyTorch and I don't know if there is any more Keras users, things change too fast. But you can see how fast we have been growing, especially from the beginning of this year, in addition to whatever we have been doing um, so far. So uh, what is weights and biases? I'm going to talk a little bit more about a product. By the way, I didn't know the vessel uh, guy uh, until Yon he told me about this event and I had a chance to look at the their product in the booth at the AI summit and uh, I was very impressed it's like really nice product and uh, a little bit of overlap with our product as well which uh, made me think a little bit um, but it's good right because this market is only opening up now and we are building more and more and we have slightly different focus catering different needs. Although we do try to be end-to-end -to -end, um, platform, both in terms of the model development, as well as the deployment and productionization and what you call the MLOps. MLOps seems to be the word that is too big and everybody seems to me some, mean something else. But basically what I'm saying is we are supporting all the ML engineers and all the people who we call ML practitioners who are involved in operationalizing AI. Not just, you know, AI is not model building, right? Just model building. It is about bringing it to the people to use, not just in business, but, you know, every one of us like us. And um, I, I didn't understand much about what the uh, other presentation was, um, but uh, we also take it very seriously that everybody needs to run in their favorite um, environment, right? So uh, you can run on-prem without internet. You know, that's what I hear a lot, especially in Korea, that you want to run in an isolated environment. We support that as well. So a few highlights about uh, weights and biases in case uh, you don't know. What we offer is productivity gain in the process of development. And not just making you more efficient, but making you more effective at what you are doing, right? Because what is ML development? It's, we call it experiment, right? Why do we call it experiment? Because we don't know what will make you make your model better. You have to try many things until you find the right answer. So being able to understand what your model is doing, being able to look back on what you have done in the process of development, analyzing it, and sharing it with your team, because ML development is increasingly a teamwork, right? So it is for us a very important thing that we support the team as well as the individual empowerment. And that's why we call ourselves in one way, a system of record, we allow you to keep track of what you have done, what code has went in, what um, data was used to create which model, and keep track of the lineage of the relationship between these uh, artifacts. And uh, when you are um, taking these models to production, you again need to keep track of them because you know, if you think about, say, ChatGPT, it all started with GPT-3, right? Or even before, right, when the transformer came up. But GPT-3 they released, and then they collected a lot of data from the users, which they used to train the next round of the model, didn't they? Right, that's GPT-3.5, and then, you know, they run it to collect more data, and that's, you know, that enabled them to develop GPT-4. Right, so development process is not done in a vacuum. Development process and the production process, you cannot pull apart, right? 
And this is the bigger life cycle of continuous development that you need to get working in order for your model to do uh, impressive stuff. So that's what we are thinking about when we are building our product. Um, so, uh, like I've already said, there's a lot of impressive customers um, in, you know, around the world, really. Um, the OpenAI being one, they are one of our oldest customers and a very demanding customer, right? As you can imagine, you know, they're training these models with hundreds of billions of um, parameters and sending all of their, you know, um, logs to us and for us to be able to reliably manage that it is a lot of hard work they made us very strong in our relationship with them but what they like the most about our product is the way that we enable them to collaborate within the team right because it is the process of innovation is it is the process of collaboration and one person finding out some insight needs to be communicated well to the other person. Ways and Biases has this feature called report, uh, which is an efficient way of sharing your insight within the or outside your team. And uh, that was, I heard, their favorite uh, feature. And they have like library of reports, which is like, you know, scientific paper, right? Almost. And I wish I could take a look at these reports and they will never show it to us. But uh, that is, is apparently uh, one of their favorite uh, features. Um, I told you that I'm based in Japan and we have been expanding. They're very fast there as well. CyberAgent, uh, in case you don't know, is a very interesting company in Japan uh, doing LLMs. And they do a lot of advertisement and they're fine tuning their model to generate uh, ad copies, advertisement copies, for example. So they're really finding meaning in developing their own models. Uh, in a customized way. Stability AI, uh, this is an engineer in uh, Japan, the Japan team of Stability AI. I really love what he says, like weights and biases is the first thing he sees in the morning, right? Uh, you know, what a good, good way to start your day. And also it is the last, the last thing he sees before he goes to bed because you wanna make sure he's not wasting his sleep time, right? When his model is running on his GPU. So, I hope everybody will be like that. Yes, please. Um, yeah, um, I, I think just looking at, uh, I mean, how many people build LLMs here? No? Everybody just watch other people. Oh, one person. Yes, thank you. One person, one person. Not everybody. Not everybody. Okay. Well, um, yeah, understandably, but many people have started uh, building and this is sort of the lineage of how these open source and closed source models have evolved right and many many companies have taken up the challenge for example uh, in Japan it might be interesting um, that so many people have either announced their intention to uh, you know they do that they say I'm going to develop and you know you never know what they're doing but also Many companies have already released their uh, LLM models. But you might notice that most of these models are 3.6 billion, 3.8 billion, 7 billion, you know, 1.6, 1.4 billion. These are not very big, right? Why? Because it's hard to get GPUs these days, right? And, you know, training 7 billion model is one thing. Training 70 billion model is a completely different story, isn't it? But Obviously, uh, we are here to support all of these use cases and, you know, Fujitsu, CyberAsian, Rina, uh, Eliza, uh, and you see, oh, preferred networks, they all are customers using weights and biases um, developing their LLMs. And, you know, there are a bunch of other companies that started using existing models. I'm not going to go too much into this today or... Maybe I should, given that not all of you are LNM developers. You might be more interested in using existing models. I will come to that as well. And, you know, there's a lot of question in the market, and probably you are asking these questions as well. There's so many models, and are they good? Like, which one is good? Which one is good for Korean language? Which one is good for some other specific 
use cases, right? And this is a very topical, important question to be answered. So for example, in Japan, there is three big um, leaderboard. When I say leaderboard, that's like a ranking, right, of models. And I can see these leaderboards are incomprehensive. They are not like mutually, you know, understandable because the models are completely different. Even if you have the same model, they are in different order, right? And probably you're not surprised, right? Because depending on the way you test the model, the result come back differently. So which one is the best way to test the model? There is no best way to test the model. You have to figure out a framework of evaluating the models for your own purposes, right? And you might be able to use somebody else's leaderboard for something, but not all. Especially your task is more specific, more um, of your own thing, then you have to come up with your own way of testing. And we have noticed, like for example, this is uh, done by Stability AI. You know, probably some of you know Evaluation Harness, they incorporated JGLUE. JGLUE is this uh, NLP test data set. There is this uh, English data set called GLUE. And I think in Korea there's CLUE, uh, is one data set in the Korean version of it. Japanese version is JGLUE. And they incorporated this data set into the evaluation framework. And I can see that they're trying to help the model a lot, right? For example, there is multiple choice questions, choose one out of four. They explicitly force the model to choose one out of four. We started a leaderboard, which I will come to next. We wanted to test more of their conversational capability, right? So I, we would just write, these are the four choices. Come back with the right answer. And most often, the answer is not a number. Models have a really hard time giving us back any one of the choices and start talking about something else, right? So that's one illustration of why it's important to think about how to test this model. Rakuda, this is another benchmark using GPT-4 to evaluate other models, which is an interesting idea, but you now depend on a model to evaluate other model. Therefore, your evaluation is relative, your evaluation is not stable, and you have all these risks, right? Although there are something very interesting about it. So that's why we use our product, parts of our product, to construct a uh, very efficiently managed leaderboard for the Japanese LLMs called Nejumi leaderboard. I don't probably have time to go into the results here, but the biggest result was, and you cannot see this, but the second in the list is Stable Beluga, which is the uh, fine-tuned version of uh, Lama 2, right? And it was the first time since we had this leaderboard that an open AI model was beaten. Right? They perform better than GPT 3.5. And you know, that's how fast these things are uh, changing nowadays. And Lama 2 uh, presumably uh, is the next big thing, or is already the next big thing, and affecting all the ways that uh, everybody's building their own model or basing your model on. And we have come to realize some different methods of customizing LLMs, right? And I think I would highlight fine tuning and prompt engineering as two big ways that you can customize your um, existing LLMs. So a lot of people talk about the amazing chat capability of LLMs, but really chat is just one way to tune an LLM, right? A base LLM, they are not conversational. They just predict the next word. And you fine tune it so that you, you can have conversation. But that's not the only way you can use this model. You can use this model to generate advertisement copies like I just mentioned with CyberAsian. You can make this model to generate you know, programming code or machine operations. You tell it to you know, move some machines these things are becoming possible too. And then there's a question of can you expand these models with your own knowledge, right? Knowledge that only your company has 
you know, in confidentiality. So you cannot just send this data to OpenAI to, you know, do the additional training, but how can you privately expand your model with additional knowledge? And this is another big area of advance in this year. We are seeing lots of new methodology pop popping up from them. So, you know, putting all of these together, uh, we are working with our users and customers on making the best choice of how to develop, right, um, what they want in terms of solving their problems with LLMs. And it begins with making a decision on how to move forward with the development and making a decision on how to evaluate your model and how to deploy it and construct a workflow, like I said earlier, of continuous development because if you are managing AI service, it is not just one model. It is models after models that you are improving on. And in this process, there is a lot of challenges that we've come to realize, just to mention a few about the complexity of training these models and the difficulty of evaluating these models. And I cannot read this and I don't remember what I wrote. <laughs> But I think it says something like you have to combine multiple, you know, elements to construct an application or something like that, right? It's, it's becoming more interesting and more complex. Therefore, you need a uh, tool like Weights and Biases to help you. That's my point. Okay, that much I remember. Right, so I took a, how, how much more time do I have? 15? Yeah, okay. That's great. And after that, we have beer. Oh, no beer? I'm totally ready for beer. No beer. Pizza, but no beer. Okay. Well, so, um, what do we, I, I, I mean, allow me to talk about weights and biases uh, in an advertisement way because um, I'm proud of the product. I, I think we can do a lot of good for you, especially if you're training LLMs. But, a lot of it I've already mentioned, right? Um, developing LLMs is a huge project at the massive scale. The scalability is a big thing. Scalability in terms of however many GPUs you are using, however many parameters uh, you are training. And, you know, we have good examples of these uh, customers who are doing that at scale. It is an iterative, repeated process, and it is an expensive process that needs to be optimized, right? You need to balance the cost against performance. We recently wrote this white paper in April, but already it feels really old, right? After five months. So uh, at the time we put everything we knew about the best practices of LLM. Has anybody read this? No? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Alan. Yes, so uh, highly recommend it, although you know, we cannot do anything about the new knowledge since then. But at, you know, we have a lot of good summary of um, best practices in building LLM models here. Highly recommend it. I, I really hope I can get some help translating it into Korean, uh, if, you have, if there's any volunteers. Come to talk to me, please. Um, but I, I think the previous talk talked a lot about distributed training, yes, uh, without me knowing the language. But, you know, that is one of the biggest problems that uh, engineers are having and, and also in the process of experiment tracking, right? So we allow users to track um, loss, accuracy, GPU usage, any other metrics that the engineer decides to track. And it can be a lot, right, in a distributed setup. So we have figured out a good way to not just, you know, keep track of these things without losing data, but in an efficient way. And, you know, you might only care the rank zero result. You might care all of the sub uh, training jobs result. You can do both of that efficiently and reliably with uh, weights and biases. And uh, a good example of that I highly recommend for you to look at the GPT Neo X. Um, GPT Neo X was developed by Eleutha AI. Uh, I think they are part of the um, Stability AI group companies, and they used 
uh, weights and biases in a very open way to uh, publish their um, result, experimental result, when they were training their model. Um, I don't know about here, uh, but the GPT Neo X has been the basis of most of the models that were released in Japan, uh, although it is quickly uh, replaced by Lama 2 for obvious reasons. Uh, but uh, still, uh, you can learn quite a lot from this example. And I will talk a little bit about OpenAI because everybody wants to know about them. And I, I really cannot say a lot about them. I probably have to ask Aaron to edit this part out. Uh, this shouldn't go to uh, YouTube. Uh, well, I only have public uh, information here, uh, to be honest. But the VP of product says they use weights and biases for almost all of their model building. And like I said, what do they like about it is, I, I highlight two things that I already talked about. One is collaboration. They, I mean, we have been there, they have been our customer even before they started building GPT models, right? You know what they used to do? They were in robotics, right? They weren't like language model. Uh, then in the middle of it, they changed to doing more and more language model after Transformer was introduced. And they needed to figure things out, right? It's not like things were in the textbook for them to know. So they needed a way to write a textbook inside the company, right? So one person learns something, writes that into a report, and then share that to everybody else in the team. And that allowed them to break through with lots of the hard problems that they need, needed to solve. And the other thing is really the volume of data that they needed to deal with. And uh, I, I hear screams from my engineering team, right? Dealing with OpenAI because they send us so much data. And, um, but that made us strong, a lot strong um, in our ability to process uh, so much data uh, in a reliable way for all the ML engineers uh, to look back on. I talk a little bit also about uh, fine tuning, how, what are the key points about fine tuning that we are helping our users and customers with. Uh, it is different from building LLMs from scratch in that you need less data, right? But more quality, right? So it is important that you have control of your data even more than in the base model training. So that's one of the things that we help with customers is that they can keep track of the different versions of the data, how they were associated with the training process and which model came out. And in the process of evaluation, how these models are responding to particular test prompts. So um, yeah, we have hugging face models uh, integration. So that's just um, the way you can do it is we have something called artifact. You declare uh, to one B that uh, you are using this artifact with whatever other artifact that is connected with. And with these simple commands, you can construct the lineage of relationship between the artifacts. When I say artifact, that is code, data, model, anything that arises in the process of development. And you can ask these questions of what was this model using as a data input data, which algorithm, which version was used for developing this model. And you can always go back to see it, which is all the important capability for you in fine tuning. And of course, hyperparameter tuning is another big topic that I get a lot of questions on. We automate this workflow of hyperparameter tuning and automatically generates these I saw something quite similar to this on Vessel website as well, but uh, you know it is not our patent, so uh, that's okay. But it is very informative for you to know uh, that which combination of hyperparameters are important for your uh, model tuning. And we uh, give you the ability to compare the models. Um, you know, in this case, you're comparing these two models and seeing what are the results of uh, these two models when given the same prompt, right? What does the first prompt say? Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. That's a strange prompt to put in to test an LLM, but maybe you get something interesting out. Yeah, but you know, if you are developing LLMs, you always have like some set of test prompts that you always throw at your model, right? And see like how your result changed 
over the different versions of model. That's another capability that we provide for our users in fine tuning. So this summarizes um, what I was talking about in fine tuning, how these different components of latent biases can be helpful for this type of activities. And finally, I will talk a little bit about uh, using LLMs instead of you know, training your own. And even when you're using existing models, it is becoming increasingly complex how you develop your application, right? So it isn't simply use ChatGPT to answer your question. It is becoming use ChatGPT to prepare your question, and then you combine that with the knowledge from vector database and put that into the context and throw that again to the chat GPT and see what comes back and you run some post-processing before showing it in your application. So this quickly becomes out of hand and we uh, provide the ability to debug this process. So what went in to this uh, prompt and what came out, what went into this stage and what came out. So this we call tracer and uh, giving you the ability to uh, visualize what's happening in your LLM uh, development. Uh, this is just a blow up of the same picture, uh, but uh, just illustrating the point that these uh, details can be given to you. And yeah, uh, there are already uh, customers using this to develop real life uh, applications. And it seems that my time is coming up quickly. So I will stop here for any questions you might have. And I would love to answer them as much as I can. Please. Oh, thank you. Thank you. My presentation. Oh, can you get my presentation? You want this? It's a compliment when I get that, right? Did I do a good job that he wants to download it? Yeah, uh, let me work on that. There's some slides that I shouldn't be sharing with you, but the rest I will give you the, I will ask Yonghi to send you the link. Can I? I hope so. Yes, so I'll do my best. Yes, please. I would highlight two things. One is that you don't have to take screenshots anymore, right? Because you know that's an ugly way of summarizing your result. And you're able to, in a way like uh, Notion, when you're editing Notion document, you can add your own insight into it in your words or pictures or any other thing. And we take that there is a variety of media types, right? So you can embed sound. Uh, for example, I was building a model that matches that you upload a video and the model generates music that goes well with it, right? And the report allowed you to put that kind of multimedia contents in an organized way for you to evaluate these models. So that's the sort of extent to which this feature can be flexible and encompassing. The other thing is the report can be live. So some people use it as a dashboard, right? So as you add more model, uh, it will reflect the result. So there's two modes to, the uh, to report. You can either freeze it or you can keep it running. So that, um, I don't know if I had a picture, but like OpenAI have this like, in a screen up in the room, it shows like a report, right? Because it continues to update uh, the key information that they selected. So I would highlight these two things. Hmm. Yes. 
for PyTorch models. Yeah, I'm not engineer enough to answer your question. However, however, I would trust my engineers in taking care of those aspects of it because if it degraded the training speed, obviously that's not ideal. But I, I'm sorry, I don't have the exact answer to that question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's zero, right? There's gonna be some effect by including it for sure. But as to how much, yeah, I don't know. 질문 두개 정도 더 받아보겠습니다. 혹시 질문 또 있으실까요? Uh, nice talk. Um, uh, as you said, since uh, ChatGPT came out, uh, things, that ha things have been changing a lot, and especially uh, the um, running, uh, training those models and running those models are easily beyond the, uh, the uh, capability of individuals. And so I think that could have affected the, the use cases and the, the demography of your users of the uh, WMB. And I, I'm, I'm just wondering, have you ever, ever actually um, seen the changes uh, in the use cases in the, um, uh, your company, uh, your product? And then um, is, does has uh, have affected uh, the plans for your company for, for the future? Uh, yes. So. That's an interesting question. Like, uh, if I summarize, you asked first, sort of, how has user behavior changed, right? And the change is there's a lot more LLM developers using it, and a lot more focus on, on parallelized uh, training. So, for example, in um, weights and biases, there is a group feature. Um, so these are different runs of model training. Each of these have sub runs that run on the you know slave nodes. So that kind of use case is extremely in demand compared to before, as the model size has gotten bigger. Um, I think I don't know if it is motivated by that, but. A lot of serious LLM builders have GPU clusters, right? These are like big companies uh, building GPU clusters, right? And want to install weights and biases next to these clusters, right? And wanting more of the on-prem setup. Although OpenAI isn't doing that. They are actually more cloud-oriented. So I, I think it's more to do with the company strategy on that perspective. And as to our product roadmap, which was your last question, of course it affected a lot. Um, although maybe in a different way than uh, you think. So this is really like a business strategy talk, right? But it's an interesting talk because if we talk about ML engineers, there's only so many ML engineers in this world, right? You know, if you go out to the street and ask are you an ML engineer, <laughs> right? The most likely answer is no, right? So our market, right, total inaccessible market isn't very big, right? However, LLM, especially in the way of fine tuning or uh, prompt engineering, right? This is lowering the barrier for developing this type of applications, right? So that's why this is the new set of product lines that are targeted at that group of people. So I think uh, that is, we are trying to incorporate that uh, new group of uh, prompt engineers, or I, I don't know, prompt engineer is gonna stick, right? Maybe next year we're not even talking about it, but maybe we will. So yeah, we are looking at that quite seriously as a new market. Thank you. <laughs> 또 질문 있으실까요? 네. 네, 마지막 질문 받고 so many questions. If I did this event in Tokyo, there is not so many questions. I'm very impressed. Very impressed. Uh, okay, hi, thank you. Thank um, you. Can you elaborate more on distributed um, support? Uh -huh. So it can be uh, multiple models uh, in parallel or one model, um, multiple instances of one model at the same time or one, one model, uh, it could be gradient um, computation can be distributed or 
etc. So, mm -hmm. what do you mean by uh, distributed support? Um, it, may, it can mean different things, right? I, I think most common way in the LLM training is you are training a big model, right, with hundreds of billions of models, and you cannot do that on a single node, right? You cannot do that on a single GPU, right? And each node have, let's say, eight GPU, and you need 30 nodes, right, of these machines to train one model. So that's one way of distributed training, right? So your model training is distributed over multiple GPUs, over multiple nodes, and comes back to rank zero to form a single model in the end. So that's one type of parallelization. Another type of parallelization is in the process of um, hyperparameter tuning, for instance, right? So you have a version of a model which you want to explore with different set of hyperparameters. So you send the same model building job, but slightly different parameter set to another machine, and another machine, and another machine. I guess that's easier to uh, distribute it. That um, is an easier... Those tasks, yeah. Yes, however, in the meeting that I was in, in this morning, I didn't know how to answer, what if you want to distribute hyperparameter tuning for model training that needs to be distributed across multiple nodes, and I can understand these are like a practical questions. Uh, I didn't have a quick answer to that, but that is also a way that distributed training can be distributed, and it is a thing that's happening. Okay, thank you. Thank you.